was in uh, that the Association of Clinical Psychologists of uh, Michigan introduced me to one of their conferences as a psychologist. I myself did not know till that time I was a psychologist. And uh, I tried to understand what uh, psychiatry and clinical psychology was. Today you've given me a chance to think aloud on that subject. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> and I also want to thank Alan and Linda for uh, preparing homemade cookies for us this morning. You might have enjoyed your coffee. I'm glad to be back in Hartford, Connecticut and to meet uh, uh, several old friends here. I think I met them in Boston too, in Massachusetts. So maybe the, the entourage seemed to have traveled over here. Is there anybody who was not there at all? Okay, thank you. Is there anybody who has never heard me before? Thank you. So there is somebody I can address <laughs> in earnestness taking a chance to at least convince one newcomer. Uh, the, the psychology that uh, the professional psychologist and uh, psychiatrist speak of is the functioning of the human mind as uh, they understand it as a function of the human brain. That like other organs in the body, the brain has its own function and is distributed throughout the body through the nervous system. And they believe that these neurons that can travel through the nervous system, they convey messages to and forth. And the sensory systems bring all the messages back into the brain. And the motor systems carry out the instructions of the brain to the rest of the body. And so a variety of functions are performed to keep the body alive and well. And hopefully the mind also well. So mind and body are treated together. They don't consider that we should keep mind, spirit and body all whole and healed. Sometimes they use the word spirit. We should be whole mentally, spiritually, bodily. Then you stop and say, where does your role come when, you, when it comes to spiritually healthy? You say mentally, spiritually, bodily, that means physically. Physically and mentally one can understand. But if your understanding of the human mind is only of the brain and its mental function, where does spiritual come in? Their answer and a classic answer has been what you call a spiritual attitude, what you call spiritual activity is all mental. And therefore, we are just trying to introduce this new phrase to satisfy you. But actually, spirituality is nothing more than one of the mental functions. And you might say that the mind doesn't function, the brain doesn't function as one piece. It functions in different lobes and the right side and the left side surely have different functions. We have been able to establish that. Therefore, the intuitive mind which you think is your spiritual self, the soul, is nothing more than the right brain. And what you call the rational, logical, systematic, mental brain is nothing more than the left lobe of the brain. So we are talking of one single organ in the head and that is performing all these functions. And when you talk of going to higher regions and reaches beyond the mind, you are really talking of nothing more than a mental experience which appears to be beyond ordinary logic. An intuitive experience which is generated by the same mind and the same brain but looks higher. And therefore, you call it spiritual. This is a terminology. This is just a, a change of words and language. It's a, what they call the tautological question. And it's not really a fundamental difference of opinion. That we psychologists can really go into the same brain which you are going into. Ah, there's the rub. When they say we can go into the same brain, we try to find out how do you go into the brain they say we go into the brain by watching what a person does outside as a result of the brain. We watch behavior. We watch what the person says to us. We watch what the person sees through senses. So we watch the behavior, the external action, the external expression, 
even if it is a subjective feeling, we watch what the patient says, what that subject is saying to us. And from the outside behavior, speech, mannerism, language, descriptions, we come to know what is in the brain. I delved deeply into it. In fact, I undertook a course in psychology only to understand this point. Whether they really go into the brain through watching behavior and watching descriptions that a person is giving of the state of mind. And I found that all the descriptions that the person gives which they pick up and all the methodology adopted so far as of now to the best of my knowledge is based upon what is in the immediate awareness of a person and what is dug deep into the subconscious of a person, dug deep because it arose from memory. It happened and was pushed down into the memory and those memory blocks which are now holding that information, they try to use different methods in order to pick up the things from the subconscious, bring it to the state of awareness and say, Ah, there is a psychological cure for a trouble or a, uh, or a difficulty that arose because that trouble was submerged in the subconscious. And what we did was to pull it out of the subconscious into awareness, relive it. When it actually happened, mostly in childhood, most of these things happened in childhood. And we think that uh, because of that suppression, the child took those things very seriously and thought they were real monsters, they were actually nothing. And when they were suppressed, the child hid the monsters in the subconscious. Now when you come to a psychiatrist or you come to a psychologist, they are able through the talking out cure, several sessions of letting you talk, talk freely, free association of ideas. You come up and respond to various symbols, inputs they give you and then it all comes out from the subconscious and they are able to watch and say, now, this is what it meant. Don't you remember this happened in your childhood? So that the childhood fears, childhood complexes, the childhood problems, which look so big when they are brought back and you relive them with emotional trauma. In a grown-up state, you live with emotional trauma, but once you've gone through it, it's cleared. You understand it was just a childhood fear and you are not bothered by that anymore. This is the summary of the psychiatric method. There is nothing more. You can add more words and add more sessions and incidentally add more dollars to their fees. But the point is that their area of working, their area from where they pick out all their material for examination is the subconscious mind. In addressing the association of clinical psychologists way back, 30 years ago, almost 29 years ago, in Detroit, Michigan, I raised the question, have you ever examined that apart from picking up the material for analysis from the subconscious, you could pick up a few pieces, a few elements from the superconscious? I said, no, we haven't had that concept. That's a spiritual concept. That's what these mystics have said. We don't, we don't, we have no evidence. As scientists, we have no evidence that such a thing exists which we can call superconscious. I said, but do you, do you realize that when we talk of immediate wakeful awareness and you realize that some buried memories constitute the subconscious, there's a possibility of picking up some patterns of life that have not yet been lived of which memories have not yet been created, which may be lying in another layer called the superconscious. And have you ever met anybody who speaks from that level? This is sometimes we get across subjects who talk very strangely. We have some recorded cases. I said, why not bring them next week? We'll have another seminar. And some of them were so intrigued by the fact that the, their patients and subjects had talked of things which could not be explained by the subconscious buried memory. For example, a patient would consistently tell what would happen accurately next week. Where was that prophetic dream, the prophetic vision of that subject coming from? It could be no memory. 
it was still to happen chronologically the things that the subject was telling was happening a week later of course there are some psychologists the one professor banerji in the university of rajasthan in india he collected about 350 cases recorded cases of psychologist not of spiritualist meetings but of clinical psychologist and he collected those cases where the subjects had been expressing their problem through things that were still to happen and kept on happening as time passed by you know has anybody here ever had a feeling that you could foresee something and that that happened did you know anybody ever in this audience had it wow we have those those subjects so many here only and they are all over the world they are in every country people have seen beforehand exactly how it happened and what about these strange psychics are they patients or are they psychics is one lady living very close to chicago uh carol what's her name carol canova i met her at the spiritual frontiers meeting and she records her dreams in a book red book and she records all the dreams because her, her experience is that the dreams she has mostly come out true in a week or two weeks sometimes later here's a gentleman sitting here in the audience who just spoke of her name and he and i were supposed to meet her he didn't know that after she met me in the spiritual frontiers fellowship she invite she said i'm going to come to chicago and want to see you she did not know i was a poor man i was a rich man i was from india i was just a traveler or i lived there she had no information all she knew was i was a participant in one of their functions in philadelphia so when i told my friend clarence the clarence we i have to meet somebody is a lady who has come come here she has a strange power that she records the dreams in advance and the dreams come out true and let's go and see how does she do it is she a psychologist is she a psychic what is the difference between the two i don't understand much of this uh, knowledge and how does she do it secondly she can hold your hand and you don't have to speak and she tells you what you are thinking and she tells you what your future is what you will think in the future not what you are thinking at that time so that's a very interesting lady to me so we decided to go and see he said no no there are too many of these people he was fed up of these psychics in those days and he said let's get real let's get some real spiritual stuff not this kind of psychic stuff we had an, enough of it i said but i had given my word we have to meet even if it is for 10 minutes he said where is she i said she says she's staying in the hyatt regency and i said we'll pick her up at the uh, at the lobby she must be waiting already we are already late that's oh that's out of the way can't you tell her call her as a pager and ask her to come to our office or somewhere i said how does it matter it just a one little swing will take 5 minutes on the side and he he was a rich guy i was just his employee in those days and uh, as a consultant and he had a big limousine big black limousine stretch and it frightened me every time i saw and he big man coming from a big limousine i was always walking like this behind him we we got into that limousine and i persuaded him to go there she had recorded a dream of a week earlier that she saw the black limousine and two two of us stepping out when we reached there she was amazed to see the limousine she couldn't connect that dream with anything likely to happen and she had had that dream one week earlier and she didn't know as much as the first time of course uh, i need not add that clarence was so impressed he brought her to the office she gave readings he took her home he called all the family members and ever since then they are regularly having readings from her and every time she prophesies this is going to happen But she doesn't say that it's going to be good all the time. Sometimes she says, "Well," when she keeps quiet, it means it's not so good. Then he wants to, her to come again to see what's going to happen. The point I was making was this: that what about the experiences of these human beings that are not from the subconscious memories? 
which have been suppressed in childhood. Not only that, some of the biggest controversies arose amongst the psychologists when while they were re regressing their subjects into past years of childhood in order to find out what was their problem, what were their complexes. While they were regressing their patients, they found the patient said, when I was very young, I did this. I remember as a child and they get traumatic. They get into a great emotional state because of the emotion being relived from the childhood trauma. Then they go into a still greater emotion, emotional stress. They almost express the stress as if they are being born. And some of them have described the process of birth. They describe being born and the trauma of birth has been brought up. And then they go on. If they keep on regressing, they describe how they were old people with white hair and what they were doing. Where are they gone now? They say up to the birth was regression of memory. The rest is fantasy. And not everybody believes the rest is fantasy. Some believe they've gone further back in memory and are picking up past life experiences. Once somebody said this could be a past life experience, it became a fashion. You know, in California and some of the states in this country, people pick up this idea so quickly. In those years when I was at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I went to California. That was the hub of this kind of activity. People were just picking up any such idea, past life regression. I thought the thing is over. Recently, I saw an ad on the TV, 900 number, which I thought was all pornography. 900 number call. 995 for every minute will tell you your past life. It's a number you can dial and know your own past life just for the asking. The more you know, the more you pay, of course. They charge you what $10 a minute. This means the thing is not over. There are people still making money out of telling you your past lives. And there was one wonderful psychic who used to tell the past life. Everybody who went there, she didn't know we were all in a group. She thought these were individual clients of mine and they have come from different places. Each one of us was Julius Caesar and every lady was a Cleopatra. <laughs> People came out so happy. They said, instead of $10, we'll give you $20. But that, of course, is uh, facetious. To come back to the serious thing, the point is that when we go into fast life regressions, some, some subjects don't need to be regressed. They just remember. And we have seen some programs recently compiled and shown on American TV where researchers have found that people do remember past lives and narrate incidents which they never knew had happened. Incidentally, when I was young, I didn't believe. When I went to college and was studying science, physics and chemistry, my mind was totally against believing things that would not be scientifically proved. I was set in that mode that uh, I will not take anything as an accepted truth unless I can investigate and be satisfied to the extent a, a scientist can be satisfied. And therefore, I was uh, I was in the mode, as most uh, empirical scientists are, of rejecting something that was not immediately supported by a document or a data that had been collected on scientific means, duly published, duly circulated, duly criticized, objected to, and then there should be enough verification it is true. But when I was in college, something happened in my own house with my own sister. And uh, she was born late. She was much younger than I was. And she grew up and she lost. She got St. Vitus dance, the convulsion kind of disease, which they used to call in British England and British India as St. Vitus dance, kind of convulsion. And she lost her speech. She wouldn't speak. We thought she cannot survive. She wouldn't eat. So once she couldn't eat and speak, we thought she was going to die. We were ready for her to die because there was no cure. Doctors gave up. Then we had our spiritual teacher, our master, the great master. And my father, who was a follower of the great master, decided to take the little girl, who was then three years old, to take the little girl to the master. At least he felt that by looking at a holy man, at a spiritual man, in her next life, in which he had believed, in her next life, she will uh, maybe attain some spiritual greatness or some spiritual security. 
So we drove in our car and went there. And I was there, college student, scientifically minded, rational, uh, no uh, no hocus pocus about these uh, previous births and future births. And my father said, this little girl is dying. She has been emaciated. She is about to die. And uh, she, uh, we thought we should bring her to you. She can have a look at you. And that darshan of yours, what we call darshan of you, look at the face of a mystic will help her in her future life. And great master laughed a lot. And he said, people don't die without paying their karma. She can't die just like that. Whatever she has to do, she has to do first. And he laughed and went away. So we wondered what was the significance of what he said. Because when he said that, obviously we thought that she is already going and that's the karma she is paying. The moment we came out of the house of the great master, and we stood outside, she began to have hiccups. She began to smile, which she had not seen since her birth. And she began to utter words, she began to speak, and eventually she ate and began to grow. We thought it was a miracle. We ascribed it to the holy man that it is his miracle that she survived. But as she grew and began to say, Baba, Aa, Mama, which we taught her, and began to formulate words, we began to say she is shouting for her sister. She is shouting for her sister. She didn't have a sister. She had two brothers. Shouting for her sister. Kanta, Kanta, where are you? So what Kanta? We had a maid in the house. We thought she is training all these names. So we scolded them. Don't put these new ideas into her head. There is no Kanta around here. And then she kept on asking, where is my brother? She said, there he is. I am one of your brothers. I no, not you, the real brother. I said, what do you mean, real brother? I want to meet my real brother, Om, Om Prakash. As, as she developed her language, she didn't speak a single word of the life she was leading with us. And she constantly referred to a house with three sides, with a well from where they drew the water, and a brother, Om Prakash, and a sister's Kanta and Shanta. And we had no such names either in our own family or any family connected with us or anybody in the neighborhood. Other son, it bothered me more than anyone else because it was shaking my scientific attitude. I said, how do we investigate this? The only way a scientist investigates is, let's find out who is teaching her these words. And we tried to find out who cleverly comes in the middle of the night and puts these words into her ear and she starts speaking those words. And maybe it's because of illness, because of a long three years illness that these words are coming to her. When she said, I will tell my father, he'll scold you for talking to me like this. And my father was there. I said, why don't you tell him? She said, not him. I'll tell my father. I said, you mean your heavenly father? No, my father who has the bookstore. That was too much to give this information. <laughs> where is the bookstore? Don't you know where the bookstore is? We knew. They were, it was a small city, Hushyarpur, in Punjab, in India. There were just a few bookstores. In one main street of bookstores, they had five, six bookstores. We said, let's take her to the bookstore. We drove in our car, took her, put her on the front seat, said, point out the bookstore when it comes. She said, I will. And we made fun of her, said, there's your bookstore. No, that's not the bookstore. There's your house. That's not my house. Don't keep on teasing me. We drove. We went on. Ultimately, Tulsi Das and company booksellers, when that store came, she says, there's my house. So we smiled to each other. She doesn't know the difference between a house and a store. That's the only bookstore. And she is, instead of now saying, that's a uh, bookstore, she's saying, there's my house. So obviously it's all fantasy. So we got down and walked and we didn't know that the bookstore was the front of the house. And she knew precisely the way to the house through the bookstore. She led us there. She showed us the well which was there. The house was three-sided, the front of the bookstore. And the well was right where she had been describing for more than a year since she started speaking. There was no way I could understand how this happened. What happened next, which we have 
kept secret, but I want to share with you. What happened next was, she said, this is the well in which I died. This is the well in which my father pushed me. That there was a murder? He couldn't believe it. He said, what shall we tell this man? There is a woman who has come in the future life and telling you committed a murder in the previous life. We told the father, this girl remembers her past life. The bookseller, Tulsi Das, who, on whose name the bookstore was running, that she remembers her past life and she says, you are the father. Do you have any other children called Kanta, Shanta? And said, of course I have. But Shanta died. She died, you know. When did she die? In the August, beginning of August of that year, in the th on the 30th of December of which year this girl was born. How could that be? You mean, this girl, my mother was pregnant with this girl, pregnant, pregnant nearly five months, four months, and there was another girl living, living and walking about, and she was to die and become this child who was still to be born several months later. And he said, Tulsidas said, let me speak alone to the child. If she can answer a very special question, I am going to ask her. If she knows that, I'll be convinced she's the same girl who died and has come back in a new life. He took her aside and asked her some question. She was like doing like this, telling him. He didn't hear what she said. He cried and he came back and he gave her some money from his pocket. And he said, this is the same girl. So she went explaining to the rest of the family where her clothes were kept, what things were there, what where the tree used to grow, which has been cut. The mango tree was there. While she was talking, I asked that bookseller, what did she ask you privately that convinced you? One question you asked and you got convinced she's the girl. He said, I asked her, do you remember where we used to keep your clothes? And she pointed out to the correct wardrobe where the clothes were kept. And nobody knew. If this girl can point out that, she must be the same soul. And he came away. He said, maybe he owed her some money. And that is why she had to be reborn, go back to his house, get that money back and come, come away. When we came away, on, in the car, out of curiosity, I think my mother asked her, what did he ask you when he took you aside? She said, he asked me, do you remember this well? And I said, how can I forget you pushed me into it? So, we didn't press charges. We didn't uh, go deeply. But it was something that happened in front of me in my own house, in my own family. What? This is not a, a memory regression into the past. She didn't go to any of these 900 numbers to find out what her past life was. This happened without our effort. And then we found there were so many cases like this recorded. A person who was not in my house but very close to me described the streets of Japan so accurately that I made a note of it. And later on, when I went to Japan, I looked for the street and found the same thing he had described and he had never left India at all. How can these people talk of these places? Where is it coming from? If psychology is all that is buried in the subconscious, where are they picking up these things from? Is memory a longer thing than the physical brain? A group of Russian scientists came to investigate this and other cases in India. I participated in discussions with them because by then I had uh, got to uh, got my new ideas about this and I said I must share with them and find out what they have found. They said we don't believe in God and we don't believe in soul and we believe that everything is material. That the matter can explain everything. We have not given it enough chance. We want to do research. And uh, I said have you found out such cases? They said yes. In Russia itself we have found out. People remembering past lives. He said, "How do you, what theory is holding up to explain these cases so far? They said, the theory we have evolved is believing that materialism is real, believing that everything is in the molecules of matter. What we believe is that when a person dies, the body, either when it's buried, disintegrates into the elements or it is cremated, disintegrates into the elements and these individual molecules, the individual atoms flying free in different forms, they are carried away by 
winds, strong winds to different places. And one memory cell from the brain carrying that particular episode of life could go and become part of another body in birth. So it's really, it can be explained by what is happening in the mind and in the brain. And therefore, uh, we are trying to figure out if a person talks of Japan and is born here, we are studying whether the wind drift really brings the molecule this side. But our difficulty has been that the westerly winds which go right across the globe, carry winds in one direction and these episodes are happening in the opposite direction. So maybe there is some other way of explaining and not the wind drift carrying these little molecules of dust which are carrying the memories and therefore the chances of a particular molecule or a cell containing that brain memory and going in through the wind stream into the other country and becoming part of the food of the mother and therefore part of the brain of the unborn child and then coming back and that child expressing this old memory, the chances are so rare in, in terms of law of probability, the chances are extremely rare, but the number of cases reported is much more than the chances that the law of probability would give. So they are still examining, but they, they say under no circumstances are we going to examine an explanation other than material explanation. So once you get confined to this, it was no different than the psychologist who said under no circumstances are we going to examine an explanation beyond the functioning of the mind, even if you call it soul or spirit. In the 60s, a California man put an ad, ad in the papers. I kept a cutting and took it to India. I, I was here on a short visit. And he put an ad in the paper, anybody who can prove that a human being has a soul can can get a reward of $150,000, which was like a million dollars of today. He offered $150,000 reward to anybody who could come and scientifically prove that a person has a soul. I don't know his definition of soul. All I could say at that time was, if he can put an ad, he must have a soul. No dead man can put an ad. The fact we are alive means we have a soul. It's the living force, the vital force. It's what makes us conscious, makes us able to do the things we do. That's called spirit or soul. The mind only performs certain functions. It does not function, function like the giver of life. It partakes of life and performs those functions of sensing, reasoning, creating, mental creativity, new patterns. It can do all these things. The mind can do all these functions, but it cannot create life. The mind can create patterns. The mind can create designs. The mind can pick up sensory impulses. The mind can reason, put things into logic. The mind can declare this is the cause and effect relationship of a particular statement of a syllogism. Mind cannot possibly be the provider of life. How come? We are uh, giving so much credit to the mind for things that the mind cannot do. We have seen the best minds in the world. We have examined the best mind in the world. We have examined them by all possible means, including psychological means, and found that the entire gamut of activity of the mind can be divided into three categories. The mind that senses, which means it picks up what the senses are telling. Eyes are open. It sees, gets all the colors and forms, and then interprets. Sensing means interpreting the sensory impulses. Interprets and says, these are flowers. This is a table. This is a cup. The mind speaks this out to us after picking it up. That's sensing. The sensory perception would make no meaning at all if the mind did not perform that function. All the five senses that are picked up by different organs of the body, are interpreted by the mind and make sense. And that making sense is not a, a rule laid down in advance. It is a cultivated rule. The genetic code which gives guidance to the mind how to interpret is constantly revised. The genetic code, the DNA molecules are being revised constantly in the system and in the brain to interpret according to the additional information we have received. 
the sensing mind is that is the major part of the brain and the mind to perform a function of interpreting and telling us there is a sensible world a logical explained world around us the second part of the mind's function is which is a far more dangerous part deadly part of the mind's function is reasoning it reasons constant it never stops and the reasoning process goes on through the use of language and the language it employs in all hum i'm talking human mind human mind employs language as a means of reasoning and the language has been picked up from schools from mother tongues from different exposures language is nothing more than phonetic sounds which have certain association of ideas if i start telling a, a child from birth that this cup of water is cup of milk the child will grow up calling water milk there is no other input that will give the the sound of milk any other meaning except water if that's the only connotation the child has heard these phonetic symbols which are given connotations and meanings because of association of ideas through experience sensory experience constitutes language surprisingly each one of us has had a separate exposure to these different experiences which have constituted our language the truth is no two people can speak the same language because no two people have lived the same life it's impossible for two people to have an identical life identical exposure use a simple word chair when you say a chair a chair means the chair you can see in your imagination if you have seen one chair that's the only chair if you have seen 10 chairs chair means something common to all those 10 this was one of the ideas that socrates and plato in ancient greece it's tried to express and people have had a hard time to understand people still have a hard time to understand when they said the idealist said that chair is it a concept or an idea they said you can make a concept of a chair and make a chair out of it or have a chair and make a concept from the chair but the idea of a chair from which all chairs are created must be somewhere else and must be more real than the chair otherwise you cannot have a chair they said there is a part of consciousness not the memory not subconscious from where the first idea of a chair came and from where all chairs have been created the word chair as a connotation is coming only from the chairs we have seen but fact that these chairs could be created the idea of a chair which fits all chairs must have existed somewhere prior to the creation of the first chair where did it exist socrates proposed it existed in a world of ideas which is more real than this world we now call it the astral world we call it the world of ideas and from there it was picked up and this whole world was created it's a copy of that world these words which we are now using with our experiences which constitute language are being used by the mind in its middle function reasoning constantly never stops thinking and reasoning of the mind never stops if there is any barrier to self discovery and self realization all these philosophers found out all these mystics found out was this barrier the mind never stops thinking gives us no breakthrough to go through every time we want to find our own self the mind reasons us out of it every time we want to find god the mind reasons us into a concept every time we want to find something beyond the mind the mind says this is it and i can argue and prove to you the mind is constantly proving things to us and this barrier of reasoning which is the second function of the mind is proving to be a real barrier and not a great aid in the 60s you could go to a university you could go to different places of learning and you would find on the walls the word written one word that was a great message of the sense of that period think you remember those days anyone think they used to write the word think everywhere on every wall that what we are lacking is thinking nobody realized that all our problems are because of thinking that it every worry every fear 
every trouble, every unhappiness. I challenge anybody to come up and bring to me a problem or an unhappiness or a worry that a person has which could not be directly attributed to thinking. Thinking is the cause. And yet we at that time encouraged. Fortunately, we have removed all those boards now. We are trying to be spiritual. We want to love. Now the new word came afterwards, introduced again from California, love. Soul. But they, from soul, they went to soul music of a different kind altogether. From love, they went into a, a strange kind of activity. They still call love. But these words meant something. That we had a certain experience. And that experience was holding us back. The third function of the mind, what they call as a euphemistically the creative mind, is nothing more than rearranging the elements of perception. The elements of sensory perception, reorganized, becomes a new pattern. Wow, that's creativity. And most of this creativity comes by the mental creativity comes from there. No great inventor has ever used that. No great artist has ever used that creativity. Only the students of art schools and students of arts have used it. The born artist who has never been exposed to a school and comes up as a great musician, comes up as a great artist, has never employed these rules. He is not doing any mental creativity. He is pulling out something from the world of ideas which nobody has seen and exposes it. He is pulling out something from an area which cannot be explained as a mental thing. This line that separates the mind from the soul, from the spirit, from consciousness, from life has not been understood by the psychologists at all. They are still having a hard time. When I give them a simple definition of the function of the soul being separate from the function of the mind, they get startled. That's why they invited me. We never heard it before. It's not in our books. The definition I gave was that sensing, interpreting sensory data, thinking, reasoning, using logic, or creating, putting patterns in different form, all require time. All work in space. All follow the law of cause and effect. Do you see that? Do you see that all mental activities require this framework, a certain very tight framework called time? Talk to him. And he would tell me what he was able to achieve. I said, what did you get in two hours that you wrote such a letter? He said, I could not explain at that time. Now I can. He showered me with his love. Love flowed so transparently. The way he looked at me, the way he smiled at me. I was bathed in love. I had never experienced this before. When one gets love of this kind, one gets crazy. Thank God he was a doctor, he was a surgeon also. Not only a minister, he was a surgeon. He kept his cool. And was able to write books. Yesterday in a restaurant in Boston, one man came, a waiter, while we were having lunch. And uh, he came and uh, some of my friends there didn't want to move from a certain table. So he tried to tell them, go and move there. They wouldn't move. But then he began to sense there is something happening. So he kept on saying, there is some love, some energy here. Can't explain. And he jumped through. Later on, he had an interview with me for a few minutes. And in the interview, he told me that he had never experienced so much love anywhere. He didn't know where it was coming from. And after he had the interview, which is very brief, and I said, okay, he said, this is such a happy family. I want to be welcomed. I said, welcome. But you can't do that. He got up and he rushed and I watched him. Because interviews were in the open. Did you, any one of you watch him? <laughs> he jumped and hugged and kissed everybody. Where is he? You is now. He jumped right on top of him. I said, what's happened? The man is crazy. And later on, he told us he has never been exposed to love of this kind. This group is something different. The point I'm making is very simple. The psychologists who understand mental psychology miss out on this most essential element. Now, they are able to analyze. They are able to break apart. They are able to 
assert, they are able to feed the ego, they are able to give fresh life to a dwindling ego, but they cannot supplant it with love. They don't have it. They need it themselves more than anyone else. They commit more suicides out of loneliness because they don't have love. Love is the answer, no matter what the question. We have those buttons also. I'll bring them next time. Love is the answer. The psychology of the perfect masters. The psychology of these masters who have attained enlightenment is based upon love. People ask me, how do we heal? There are so many healers here. Healing by hand, by different methods, and they do psychological healing, psychic healing. I said, none of these healings works. Heal by love. If you don't heal by love, but heal by other mechanical or mental processes, you get sick while you're healing. Most of the healers I used to find in these healing sessions in Spiritual Frontier Fellowship were sick. They were very ill. They had taken on the karma of all the people they were healing and becoming ill themselves. And I saw, I said, what kind of people are these? They talk of healing. They talk of God. Be whole. This wholesomeness must start from them. If they are not whole themselves, how can they heal? But when you heal with love, you never lose. You gain. Once in a, in, as a child, I discussed the question of gifts. What can you give to a person? I said there are three kinds of gifts. And I was very mathematical in those days, as you can imagine. And I said gifts can be material gifts, cash or time. If I have $100 and I give away $40 as a gift, I am left with $60. The first recipient has $40 extra. The total between us still remains $100. So this is the least useful form of gift. It doesn't enhance anything. It just transfers. The better gift is the intellectual gift. Gift of knowledge. If you give knowledge to somebody, you don't lose it. If I have 100 units of knowledge and I gave away 40 units of knowledge, that 100 will still remain 100. And that will be 40. Total will be 140 between us. But love is the best gift to give. Because whatever you give, you get. If I had 100 units of love and gave 40 units, I would immediately have 140. The other person has 40. Total 180. QED. Just proved my proposal. The psychology of the Masters, based upon love, helps them not only to reach our heads, but our hearts and our souls. When we are in distress and we need spiritual help, it's no use wasting time with the psychiatrists and psychologists. It's better to go to somebody who can share love, go to perfect living master. But where do they exist? We don't know where they exist. There's only one way to find them. Seek them in your heart. You cannot seek them outside because seeking outside is a mental game. Seek them in your own heart. When you are ready, they appear in your life through coincidence. Thank you.